Pastor Megan, and today I want to give you 10 tips to help you get through candidacy and your candidacy interviews. First tip, it's not a job interview. It's not a job interview. You don't get a job at the end of it. This is a learning interview. You are hoping to be a student who gets to learn how to be a pastor. So you need to have the aptitude of someone who is who is still needing to learn and who is wanting to go to school and who's wanting to learn how to be better. If you act like you're already ready to be a pastor, people are going to compare you to their own pastor and they probably like their own pastor better than the complete stranger who's in an interview with them. So don't set up that false dichotomy, not a job interview, um, be a learner in that room. Number two, act and dress like someone who is going to be someone who can hang out with people on their very last day of life. Why? Because when people are thinking about what pastors do and they think of the most significant memories that they have of their pastors, those are the kinds of days they think of. In my candidacy interviews, they asked me if I was gonna keep my eyebrow piercings. At the time, I just thought they were trying to like make me into a cookie cutter mold of other kinds of pastors or they were trying to tell me what to do or what to say or trying to have me toned down. What I didn't know is they were trying to imagine me at a funeral for someone they dearly loved and they didn't want to be distracted about what I wore to that interview. I would have still worn the piercings to the interview, but I but being able to frame yourself as someone who can sit at the bedside, who can be serious, who can take those really sacred moments and sit with them will help you frame yourself as someone who can do the full spectrum of the job of being a pastor. Because you're still a student. They can teach you how to do the theology. They can teach you where to put your hands during communion. They can't teach you to have the attitude and the centeredness that is someone who is able to be there for people in those moments. Number three in the tips is take notes. Bring a notepad, bring a pen. Because number one, remember, you're demonstrating that you are there to be a learner, that you want the feedback of this committee. And they are required on their paperwork to write three things they like about you and three things you need to work on. Anytime you hear them say something you need to work on, you're going to write it down. You're also gonna write down their names. You're gonna write down what kind of jobs that they have so that you can kind of preemptively guess what kind of answers they might be looking for for you. So if someone says they're a parent, you might think about ways that, that you can care for all of the ages in a worship service. If someone says they're a psychologist, you can think that they might, you can be prepared that they might ask you deep questions about things they read into your psyche while. So, so write down as much as you can, show that you're a learner, show that you're willing to listen. Number four in things that you can do, give examples of different church contexts. If you only ever talk about how much you love to feed the homeless or just one type of church that, that you're a part of, the candidacy committee will be afraid that you will not be able to get a job after you finally finish school or that the, the large number of open jobs in congregations is something that you might say no to or you would turn down, or they might be offended. They might think that you don't like their kind of faith and you wouldn't want to be their pastor. And so the, if you can, if you have experiences of visiting different kinds of church, you could say things like, if someone asked you, what would you do if someone wanted to be baptized and they weren't connected to a church? Well, you could answer that question a lot of different ways. But one way that I, I give as a tip is to say, well, I imagine if I was the pastor of a congregation in rural South Dakota and they were a part of a very tight-knit community, that really getting to know the congregation deeply is one of the steps that would be a part of that confirmation service because the whole town's going to want to root for this baby. And isn't that the heart of baptism? But I can also imagine being a pastor in a really bustling city where people work three or four different jobs, they're not able to get the time off, um, or people aren't able to like develop those kinds of long-term relationships. And I would encourage that person to get a small community that they can work with or lean into their family community. Um, and if they work three jobs and they can't be there at the typical worship service, I could ask members of the council to come together so we could still represent that community of faith together. Giving diverse answers proves that you're a flexible person and that you understand that you are, as a pastor, called to care for the faith of other people 
even though seminary is going to be about learning about your own faith in a really deep, intense way. So you want to show that you are flexible. Number five on the list, I guess, is read the list of pastoral responsibilities that outline the work that you would do. So I, I'm a part of the ELCA, the Lutheran Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We have a constitution that lists 12 different things that pastors are supposed to do. Read that list an hour before you go to that candidacy meeting so that you can draw from it. If all of your examples, again, are just one of the 12 responsibilities of a pastor, you wanna just broaden your answers about things that you can imagine yourself doing as a pastor in a church. One of them is feeding the homeless, but one of them is like caring for the sick and people who are dying. And, and some of them is helping to like discipline members of your congregation. That might not be fun or fun to talk about, but showing that you know more of the, the things within a pastor's job description than just the one or two that might have drawn you to seminary will show again that you want to be a well-rounded person. Number six is a little bit harder. You want to be someone who demonstrates boundaries. Remember that there's a lot of pastors and a lot of communities that have been injured by people who have had sexual misconduct. And a large part of the candidacy pro process is designed around trying to vet people so that churches don't get sued in the future because they do inappropriate things. One way, if you don't know a lot about boundaries or how to talk about your own boundaries or what professional boundaries of a pastor might look like, you can read the guides on the ACPE website. They have a list of ethics there. It's the Association of Clinical Pastoral Education. I believe it's acpe.org. Um, and they have a pretty thorough list of ethical rules that are about not taking advantage of other people and helping people not um, feel lied to even if what you said wasn't necessarily a lie. So the pastoral boundaries are a little bit bigger than other types of boundaries because we don't want to mislead people. Okay, so read those if you, if you don't know much about boundaries. Right? Seven is practice interviewing. Practice interviewing with friends, practice interviewing with other people. Ask people if they could just ask you random questions you think they might ask. The more you practice telling your faith story, if you don't have a lot of experience with it, or, or having people help you figure out what are the things I'm gonna name when they say, what do I need to work on? Have people talk through that with you, because you might be able to just adjust a few words that help people understand the heart of you, and that might be better. Number eight is get an accountability partner. An accountability partner, and you're gonna call them that in the interview, is a person who will tell you the truth and give you honest feedback. An accountability partner is someone you can say, I have this dream that we should paint an entire church lime green and put it on top of Mars and then people will all wanna to come to church. So that when you have a wacky idea, as well-meaning or wherever it came from, that person's gonna go, well, no one's on Mars, so you know, doesn't don't people need to come to the church? Um, you want someone who's going to be able to give you really good feedback or someone who, if you're going through something difficult, is going to help you process it so that you're not needing to overshare in a sermon, for example. Um, an accountability partner can be a therapist. It could be a spiritual advisor, but it also should be someone who does pastoral work. Um, so it could be another student at seminary if it's someone you can bounce ideas off of. Call them an accountability partner and and tell your candidacy committee you will check in with them and work with them on the things they want you to work on and they'll think that you are an amazing person. Number nine, journal about church experiences that have meant a lot to you or pastors that are really good at what they do and maybe inhabit skills that you would like to grow into. So for example, when you're coming up with your list of like what's the three things you should work on, if you said, well, um, in Kansas City, Pastor Heather um, is able to, when she gives a sermon, she's able to do it without notes and I want to work on that. It doesn't have to be, I need to like change my attitude and be able to like write eloquently. Remember, it, uh, you want to pass at the end of this. So you don't want the things that you're talking about that you're working on to be so deep. But if you make it about things you've noticed in other people that you want to ascribe to, again, you're demonstrating that you're a learner. Number 10, and this is really the most, most important. 
So many people, particularly the diverse people, who are feeling like maybe they have to fight their, into the, their way into the church or justify why someone who has a body like them or an attitude like them or dresses like them or piercings like them or te whatever the thing is that makes you feel like you might have to educate people in your candidacy committee, resist the urge to tell other people why you are worth accepting just for these interviews. Because in a job interview, which this is not, if you were gonna go work at Pizza Hut, you would wanna do what you could in that interview to prove that you're gonna be a good employee and that you're gonna like have safe pizza making practices and that you're gonna be kind to people and that you're gonna like count money really thoroughly, right? Those are the skills you're trying to demonstrate. At, a, at an interview like this, you wanna prove that you're a learner. You wanna prove that you are faithful and that you have your own spiritual life, but also that you care about the lives and the spiritual lives of others. Pastors, a great most of their time, don't have authority figures who are like, be a pastor exactly this way. You might have that if you're a part of a congregation that has lots of staff and there's like a head of staff. You might have that if you're a part of a denomination that has really hierarchical, like bishops get to tell you what to do or where to go or place you. But for the most part, congregations depend on pastors being able to take feedback seriously and to work on their growth areas. And that's even when you don't agree with someone's feedback. There's a reason that continuing education is a part of almost every pastor's salary. It's because congregations want their pastors to be people who learn to do things better and take their feedback seriously. So if you have a hard time with that, um, remember you're gonna write down all the feedback they give you and then you're not gonna just you know, put that notebook away until your next interview. You have to look at that notebook and work on those things that they give you for an entire year with your accountability partner so that when you come back for your next interview and they ask you how you worked on the things they asked you to work on, you'll have a list. You'll say, I, I shined my shoes, I whatever you did. Um, but it's gonna be proving that you took their feedback seriously. If someone gives you feedback that in your, if, if a friend said it to you, you might say, that their feedback was borderline racist or sexist or homophobic. If they are giving you feedback that is not just, remember that this is not a job interview. This is an interview to be a student. So you're not their pastor, so you don't need to fix how they feel about you. You just need to demonstrate that you're willing to accept feedback. And it's not just, and it's not the only moment those individuals are gonna to have to learn about someone like you or the things about you that they're having a hard time with. But I want you to be a pastor. And it, it's not that you are not, you're gonna be inauthentic and it's not that you're lying about who you are. But I want you to embrace this phrase. Um, I don't, that's not how I see myself feedback you've given me is not how I see myself, but I take it really seriously and I'm going to work on it anyway. That's not how I see myself, but I take your feedback seriously and I will work on it anyway. Does that mean that you have to become a straight person, change your race? No. But it can mean that the ways that what you work on is how to communicate better that you love that person. So, for example, in my pastoral life, I have a rule. If someone gives me the same feedback three times, no matter how strongly I disagree with them or I've decided that they're wrong, I will take it 100% seriously. <clears throat> that could mean that I read a book about that perspective that I don't understand, or it could mean that I work on my communication skills. That's usually, that's one I go back to a lot. Because if someone doesn't understand my heart, and so they think I don't love them, or they think that I um, am not interested in hearing their feedback when I feel very interested in hearing their feedback, then I'm not communicating how I feel to that person effectively. So if there are ways that you can find even the tiniest nugget of something you can work on, 
without making this the Norma Ray moment, right? She stands on the coffee table and she goes on a strike. Because I desperately want you to be my colleague. I desperately want you to make it through candidacy because I do think God has called you. I do think a community is calling you. And those moments of trying to figure out how to make it through that candidacy interview, when someone has broken your heart with the question they have asked, is how you will be as a pastor as well. Because people might say something in the handshake line after church that breaks your heart and you still need to be their pastor. Um, someone, a colleague might say something that breaks your heart and you still need to like be in relationship with them for the sake of your work. Will justice happen? Yes. Will those attitudes get education? Yes, but it's not you that has to be the one to do it. In candidacy, you are vulnerable because you are dependent on this seemingly random group of people to give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down that God gave you so long ago. And I know God loves you, and I love you, and I want to be a cheerleader for you. So um, that's just my list of 10. If you've got other ideas of things that were helpful when you've gone through candidacy, leave them in the comments below. Also, if you want to reach out to me, you can DM me, you can email me, you can call me, and I will be your cheerleader through candidacy because I, again, desperately want you to be my colleague. I love you guys. Take care.